We are live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, the menace, and he, the Stan, the man. A Stan or B Stan, depends on who you ask. Yeah. Uh, we got a pretty cool little episode tonight. We got the man behind the UFC. How many years ago would you say? Um, forever. I think he was there for like 15, 20 years. I actually. Oh, think- yeah. We'll get it the more of the detail when we get him on here. But Burt Watson, he's the. I don't know if he came before the Zufa era, but I know the whole Zufa era, he was the guy up until. Yes, yes. Up until very recent. Yeah. Uh, so yes, now looking at it, I should have been on the other side of my setup. Tomato, tomato. But we should, yeah, that's good. But yeah, episode 105, Menace and the Man. It's good to see you again, wow. Menace. Likewise, your hair's looking pretty good. Yeah, Menace is back in the gym, I saw. For a teenage boy, your hair's looking pretty good. For a teenage boy? For me? I meant girl. I meant girl, yeah. I was like a teenage girl. <laughs> he's here. I told you, he's very punctual. All right, so let's see what punctuality looks like. I mean, he was ready to go at like 5.30. There he is. What? Well, Bam! We got you, Bert. Bam! What's up, baby? <laughs> What's going on, big dog? Man, you know the drill. I'm trying to make it, baby, one day at a time. Yeah. Is that volume good? Yeah, that volume. Yeah, well, I can hear you really good. Okay. All right. Well, shit, I'm ready to roll, baby. <laughs> so we already we already went live. We're just we just have people come in wild. But uh, I was kind of doing an intro of you, and I was like, Bert Watson was the man behind the scenes of the UFC. And I was trying to think of, like, I don't know when you started there. <laughs> man, I I, uh, I actually, I think I was probably the maybe the third hire. Uh, I started my first UFC in UFC 30 in 2000. That was, that was the very first UFC that I did in, yeah, I think it was, don't quote me because I'm old. Okay, it was thirty or thirty. It was two thousand or two thousand and one. But I was in UFC thirty. That was the first, and I did every one of them up until one eighty five. That included the tough, tough finale, the Ultimate Fighter, uh, the Underground, and the WEC, and Strike Force, and all those things combined. I did every one of them up until up until I left. I think it was one eighty five. And you left, you weren't fired. No, I left. You retired, right? I, I, <laughs> well, I had a, I had a, a slight disagreement okay. uh, with, with one of the executives there. Not when they got bought out? Uh, no, this was, this was before, and it was just before they got bought out. And it wasn't Dana White, and it, right, right, it right. wasn't Lorenzo Fertitta. Someone else said something to me that, uh, at the time, I thought questioned my integrity, questioned my work performance, and just questioned me. And I, I, I kind of had been spoiled a little bit because I wasn't used to being questioned. Right. And, and he did. And, uh, of course, I, I, I am Bert. I am also Philly. <laughs> okay. And all yeah. of that came out at the same time. You know, he got mad Bert. He got Philly Bert. We got all of them at one time, and uh, I just, you know, said my said my mind and, and kind of walked in another direction, and it yeah. actually stayed that way. Yeah, uh, but that was in twenty fifteen. Now, what was your actual like? I know what your role was. I just don't know what it's called or what you know. What I mean, I was the I was the the coordinator, and what I did actually. Once the matchmaker, who at the time when I first started was Joe Silva, right? Once he had put the fight together, and while he was putting the fight together, 
or while he was matchmaking, I was the person who was in charge of or worked with the team that went out and and initially when we first started, when I'm, I'm talking about UFC 30, 31, 30, when we was you digging You were doing ditches. like seven, eight jobs. Yeah, when we when we was digging ditches, baby. You know, when once the fight was made, I went and got the hotel and kind of got the transportation and that was all on you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is a nightmare. Yes, sir. Transportation. Uh, once the flights were booked, I got all the flights. I coordinated the pickup for all the fighters. I coordinated the arrival at the at the airport, from the airport to the hotel. Once they got there to the hotel, I coordinated with, there was a group, uh, an admin group headed by, uh, at the time it was a young lady, uh, her name escapes me. Then Don, Donna Marcolini came in and Tony Barbosa and yeah. they they had hotel rooms. So I coordinated the hotel rooms with them. I set up the workout rooms for everybody. I, I, I made sure that everybody had a per diem, that they were on the list. I had to coordinate the rooming list because... Can't play on the same level, right? The worst thing you needed to do was to walk out of your hotel room and walk right into the guy that you were fighting. His room was right next to yours. So I coordinated rooms to make sure guys were were separated and comfortable and that they had access to me, the office, the workout rooms. Uh, I made sure all the rooms were set up. And then I, I met everybody. When, when every fighter came in, I personally met every individual fighter. Personally. One yeah. on one, eye to eye, baby. And you gave each person the, yo, this is what we're doing. Here's your itinerary, what you put together. Yes. Be there. Don't be late because I will pull your ass off the card. Real. Well, well, you know what? I, I also, as you know, when you guys got in and got to the hotel, I had somebody there to pick you up. Right. I had somebody there to bring you to me. When you came to me, first thing I did was I put you, took you I'm to scared. a scale to wait. Uh, so I was responsible to make sure we had scale. So I got the first set of scales. I got. I made sure we had at least when we had events, we had a minimum of three scales on set. While we're on that subject, what's the craziest weight you saw? Like usually it was a Tuesday, right? Yeah. They fly in Tuesday for a Saturday night fight. What's the craziest weight you saw? We're like, bro, what? What? Realizing now, I'm a guy that came from boxing. And in boxing, if a guy week of was five pounds, four or five pounds over, there probably wasn't going to be a fight. Okay. It, it was Panic City. Yeah. The craziest weight I ever saw was 26 pounds. Now, I'm not going to shame him, <laughs> okay, and tell you who it was, but 26 pounds was the craziest weight cut I've ever seen. And again, this was my intro to MMA. I, I didn't know what MMA was before I was introduced to it. And I wasn't very familiar. So I had to learn it very quickly. So I didn't think it was possible, physically possible for a guy. And I've been in, I've been in work with professional athletes since, I'd say, 1983. I didn't think it was physically possible for a guy to lose 10 pounds in a week. Had no I idea. usually showed up 12 over. Uh, 158 yeah. was my... I would get yeah. out there and be like, please be 158. I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, I, I know. But but I also, I got to know the guys that I didn't, that I wasn't going to have a problem with. I got to know, and you were one of them. Yeah. And, and not just because I'm sitting on your show, because yeah, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you weren't, I'd, I'd out you right now. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're into. We, we, we like thinking about each other. Stan likes to make people make me feel awkward. So if you feel it's there, yeah. hey, man, I'd, 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 I'd out you with the swiftness. But yeah. you were good, you know, and, and I had to really get used to guys coming in and needing to lose 10 pounds. That was unfathomable to me. It was not possible, but I learned very quickly right. that it was par for the course. Because of the fact that you guys were grapplers and wrestlers, you were used to cutting weight 
and and cutting a certain amount of weight during the week. So I didn't know I didn't know about it. The guy stepped on the scale, and the fight was 155, and this guy was almost 170 pounds, 171, and I was like, whoa! But you know, I learned real quick. I saw I saw you guys did it. I you know I I had to go along with it. I snuck into the workout rooms because I had to make I had to get the workout rooms together as well. Number one, I had to make sure that they were in a secure place. I had to make sure that that the scale was there, a scale that worked, a scale in each room. Right. I also learned as I went along with you guys that you guys picked each other up and ran each other against the wall. And, and yeah, that or, divider. Or, right, or started against the wall. Now that's not very good in a hotel that had those those walls that you pulled out. That was not right. very good to yeah. lean up. Very few times I got called, uh, Mr. Watson, we need you to go in there and look at our wall in that hotel room. I and a lot of, so when the hotel had any problem, they called you. I made it a point that once I got to the hotel, got the room set, and got everything straight, I got to know where the security is. I got to know where the front door, the back door, where the kitchen was. Then I went to the manager of the hotel, and I was very explicit. I said to them, "You call me before you call the cops." And I and I and they knew exactly what I meant. I said, "Now I'm not saying this to scare you, or that my guys are going to misbehave, but I need to be the first phone call before you made that second phone call." You know, because you guys were a little frisky. You know, well, you I mean, in terms of because I remember the workout room was just like guys would there be sweaty towels everywhere. Like their mom was gonna come clean up after them. Yeah, Cups oh, yeah. everywhere. But Someone you didn't have, soaked underwear somewhere. You know what I mean? Uh, all hanging hanging off the scale and left them on the ground and uh, you know. But but I understood that. I learned that very quickly, and I had a group of guys that we went behind you guys and. You know, when you came into the workout room the next day or in between shifts, those rooms were always clean. The towels were always picked up. I always created the room and set the room up so that you guys only had a certain way to go. I got a quick question in terms yes. of it's regarding me, in terms of doing the right things. You said you worked up to UFC 185? Yes. UFC 180, it was me versus Ricardo Lamas in Mexico City. Yes. Where Mark Hunt almost got kidnapped like twice, right? Almost three times. <laughs> we'll get to that. But so I lost that fight, whatever. The next time I lost, which a couple years I stand? Yes. What do you say, Lamas? Then after Lamas. Who did I lose it? Maybe Jeremy Stevens? Yeah, Stevens was right after long. Uh, they had, like, almost security following me around. And, like, I'm not – and I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And I forget who told me, like, yeah, Dennis, they said you caused, like, $11,000 worth of damage after your last loss. And that's why we have people following me. I'm like, no, I fucking didn't. I kicked, like, a garbage can or two. <laughs> Well, maybe maybe they were five thousand dollars a piece. Okay, I don't. Hey, I wasn't sure if maybe you had. I mean, obviously, you have so much. Was well, there well, anything like Dennis was destructive? Cost a lot of money. Well, here's here's what I what I do remember, and it wasn't who was the guy that was in charge of your camp. Uh, Trimble. There you go. There you go. The big guy. Trimble. I was I was told that after after that the the you know that that you had gotten upset with somebody and that you were tossing stuff around and you know and, and just just not being respectful. That's the way it was told to me. But then okay. everybody, the, the one thing that I had to do was I understood you guys being upset. I understood when you guys lost. Or when you guys won, you 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 really you you lost it a little bit, you know you oh you for sure so happy or so sad you, yeah. your surroundings you know they were just there, so I had to 
go around and, and tell tell them that that's why I always said, call me before you call the cops. I always said to them, listen, these well, guys this was like, at the arena. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Same thing, yeah. same thing at the arena. I would tell them that these guys, you know, if, if things get a little out of hand, as opposed to you trying to control it or get in the middle of it, get to me first and let me talk to them. As opposed, because this guy didn't know how, you know, you were upset. Right. I definitely told a guy or two, like, if you don't get the fuck away from me right now, it's not going to be fucking good. Like, And I'm not, like, I will kill you. I probably said that for, like, like, and I'm, like, tearing. I got, like, my eyes are probably, like, red. And I'm, like, bleeding somewhere. Like, and, and maybe one, one like, of them, one of the, one of the officials was a lady. Okay, who you scared? The to, hair? Yes, oh, you scared definitely. her. To death. Gave her the crazy eyes. I did. Gave her the crazy eyes, probably. Yeah, she, she, but, 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 you know what? At, 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 at the time, you got to realize that we were, we were brand new. We were a brand new sport. They didn't yeah. know how to approach you guys. They didn't know how to accept you guys. They didn't know whether to be afraid. You know, or rather somebody was going to punch them in the face or whatever. And the one guy said to me, he said, he said, your guy there cursed one of my officials out and told him not to come in the room. <laughs> so, you know, I, under I understood that. Now, I, I don't know exactly what you said to him, but I was told that you threatened them and told them that they better not come back in that room. So they yeah, were I wasn't leaving the room, I think. <sighs> Wait, that did happen. That might have happened. Oh no, he's what he's saying is definitely true. Because I'm like in my locker room, and they they would listen. They don't know exactly what they're doing, but it was like in my like bubble. If I did like a fucking tornado kick, I would have kicked them. Yes. Like, don't even. And they're like, I probably look like a caged animal. Like looking at me, just like what is like this guy is a complete psychopath. So like it's it's. It's like a, a car crash. You can't look away. So, like, they're probably staring at me because I'm fucking losing my shit. I'm like, you guys, like, stop, like, go away. Leave me alone. Like, fucking, even my corner's like, I just, I'll look over here. And just, yep, 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 yep. In the, yep. the 11,000 in damage, menace, maybe it was some therapy bill. I did, I, I am definitely, I was hoping he would be like, oh, you broke this. Like, I am definitely didn't do 11,000 dollars with you. No. No, Therapy. I will say this. I will. I don't I will, know what the number was, but they said a thousand some whatever. Yeah, it was. It, it, it was. It might have been. It might have been a couple of hundred, maybe five hundred something. But 11, I think it's 000, bullshit. I think Karina knew. Hey, these guys got enough money to pay us for shit. Let's just like throw a tab at them. They'll pay it. Well, you know, it, it's it's. I had that happen to me once, and we were in Atlantic City, and it was. It was, I, I forgot exactly what, which UFC it was, but Frank Mir was on it. And he actually was, was in the room working out with his father. His father was with him. And somebody threw somebody up against the wall and broke the pitcher. The pitcher came off the wall and the pitcher cracked down. That was the first call that I got. Then there was a situation down at the front desk where we had the, the check-in desk was in the lounge, the lobby of the hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had the checkout, and then right across, you had like a bar area, and everybody always, even yep. though you guys weren't drinking, you know, or anything like that, and weren't smoking, there was no smoking allowed, but you weren't drinking, but you were crowded in that bar. And some fan came over to Mark Coleman, and Kevin Randleman wow. and said to them that that shit wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, of all the people to say it to, those two look the most like pro wrestlers. Oh, well, now, let me tell you that, and I'm, the point I'm getting to was a scuffle broke out and they chased this guy into the bathroom. The guy ran into the bathroom and locked the stall. Well, how do you think they got in that stall? <laughs> okay. They grabbed the top of the stall and they ripped them. 
They ripped the stall. That was the most expensive tab that the UFC ever paid. And that was, I think that was like about, they did about five or $6,000 worth of damage in that bathroom. Trying oh, to get that. Guy you know what's there. funny? I was going to segue to that. Bert definitely has some Phil stories. Baroni. <laughs> Phil Brony is Stan's cousin. Yeah. Uh, you know what's crazy? <laughs> I just talked. To, I just talked to Phil about. Well, I didn't talk to him. I texted him about two months, about a month and a half, two months ago, and he's still Phil Baroni. He yes. has not changed. I I ran into Phil because I, I did a little bare knuckle. And Phil was in a bare knuckle uh, event in Wyoming, maybe? Was it Wyoming? Somewhere in the mid, yeah, somewhere over there. I, in the think, I, think, it, I think it was somewhere in the, in the Midwest. And somehow Phil didn't want to fight or didn't, he, his opponent was, cha was changed and they were trying to negotiate and the negotiation didn't come out right. And I had a conversation with him. And my conversation to him was, Phil, listen, these guys, I don't know these guys. You don't know these guys. Just get your fight, get your money, and get out of here. Well, that didn't happen. And Phil was blaming me for the fact that them guys duped him for his money. And that was the nature of the phone call two months ago. You still owe me $40,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, was, it was not a real good situation because the guys, whoever they were, I don't even want to mention their name. Some of the guys. Wait, there was a bare knuckle, uh, bare knuckle fighting series that was like kind of fraudulent, right? The one that, that was not like BKNF. They had Fox Rudin like it's not, it's, 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 for it. Yes, that was that was the one that they had some problems with, you know. And Phil Baroni two months ago asked me where was his money. <laughs> I said, Phil. You know what? You still crazy as hell. But I was on the phone. Okay, I was not <laughs> yeah, in front yeah, of his, yeah, yeah, yeah. in front of. But you know, Phil was no different than any other fighter that lost a fight, or won a fight, right. or was upset. You know, with certain things, it, it, it didn't take much. It didn't take much to set you guys to another direction when you were during the week of cutting weight. Yeah. And fight week. You know, I got four people in the course of the week. I got the guy that showed up that, that finally got a fight, that finally made it to the UFC and was where he thought he was needed to be. I got the guy that had to cut weight. I got the guy that either made weight or didn't make weight. And then I got the guy fight night. So that's four different people out of one guy in the course of a week. Yeah. And, and I had to adjust. To every one of them. You know, I remember when uh, Forrest Griffin fought Anderson Silva and he lost that fight. Now, when you lose the fight, you're supposed to walk out of the ring, follow me down the hall, back to the dress room, get checked by the doctor. Well, he didn't do that. He lost that fight. He jumped over the cage and took off. And I had to chase him. <laughs> and then I didn't know where he was going, and he didn't know where he was going, but he was running. And he didn't go in the direction that we came out of. He just went through the crowd and went back. He took off, and I, I, I went behind him. And finally, I just kept. I didn't want. I didn't. I wasn't chasing him because I already had. You know, I have guys set up to bring the next guy out, so I had yeah. my guys in place. I just. Followed behind him until he got tired of running. Because if I had chased him, he'd have probably ran faster. Uh, okay? Or probably had gone a different. Finally, he decided he wasn't. And I let him do what he wanted to do to get over it and to get it out of his system. And he did. Yeah. So while we're on that topic, so I remember like in our like little pre fight uh, meetings, you'd yes. be like, listen, after your fight, Go back to your locker room, chill out, relax. I don't want you guys out in the stadium. For real. Did you, were there any problems with that ever? Well, there, there, there was because guys always, and the only reason, and I'll say this now, the only reason I ever really said that was because at the time, 
they weren't giving me tickets. You know, I eventually worked my way up to getting tickets where I had a spot for you guys to sit. Because initially, they wanted to sell every seat in that arena. Right. So there was no place for you guys to sit. So I would tell you, go back, go to the locker room, go sit down. And the next thing I would, I'd know, I'd be in the back, and somebody would come to me. One of the ushers would come to me and say, uh, Mr. Burt, uh, we got a couple of your guys out there sitting in somebody's seat, and they're afraid to go sit down. They were afraid to come back and tell you guys <laughs> to get up out of their seats. And I would walk over, and I would just stop it and just look. I didn't have to say anything, you know. They just dropped their heads and got up, <laughs> right. went on back, <laughs> went on back in the room. They knew they were wrong, but if they went out and sat in somebody's seat, and that person came back, that person did not go over there and tell you guys to get out of their seat. Right. They just they went straight to security and said, "You got to help me." You guys were not going to do anything to anybody, right. but you know, right. you wanted to watch the fight, so I eventually worked my way into getting a monitor in every room and eventually yeah, yeah. worked my way into getting monitors in. The, I had to work my way up to all those things. Monitors in the back room, monitors in every room because everything was costly and they were watching everything and they were watching me. You know, they didn't tell me what to do or how to do it, but they sure had their eyes on it, baby. Yeah, so now, yeah, yeah. When you leave there, was there like an understudy from you that steps in and takes over your role? During the course of my time there, I trained a total of 30 guys. And each fight, I had four to five guys working with me, but all those guys had other jobs. So I had to alternate. So I had a system and I taught everybody how to do my system. So everybody there around me knew exactly it was rotation in place. I learned that in the military. I was in the Marine Corps, and it was rotation in place. When I moved out of place, you knew how to slide in there and slide out. Got you. If someone got sick or wasn't feeling good or family what wasn't there, then, then someone else would come. And I rotated those guys so that I very seldom got caught in an event with everybody that didn't know what the hell they were doing. Right. You know, and and that happened. The bigger the event, it seemed like the less somebody knew what the hell they were doing. You know, I had events with three people that knew what they're doing, and I had events with eight people and nobody knew what the hell. But we made it work because, I, I as you know, I kept a tight grip on most of it, on most of you guys and what you guys – we're doing because once everything else was going on, the only thing that mattered is that you guys were in the cage. Right. Not to say that they didn't care, but they figured Bert Watson had that settled, you know, so all we got to do is they had a backstage manager and all he did was come to the, come to the, the main entrance, the walkout. And that was it. I had to have everybody there on time, in place, on cue, in set, and, and hold you guys there while they move. Did you have anything, like, so there's, like, a production team there that films everything? Totally. Like, they were going off of what you wrote down? Well, no, they had a script, a production schedule, which was maybe anywhere from four to seven pages of everything timed out, the time that they started, if there was a cue for a commercial, a cue for buffer, a cue for, for one of the cage girls to get in, they had that. And every fight, if we started at 4 o'clock, the first fight was in the cage no later than 4.04, no later. The next fight had to be in the cage no later than 4.28, and I memorized that. I memorized every time by name. Like Bermudez was the third fight. I We started at 4 o'clock. I know Bermudez had to be in that ring by 5.15, 5.16. So I remembered and memorized. I didn't get smart until I got older, okay? <laughs> I memorized your fight and your time. And I, I, I knew 
I know who you fought. So whoever was the blue corner, the first guy out, I had his name. I memorized his time. And you had to be in there specifically at that right. time. So when a fight, so like when, when whatever production team gives you like the scripts, yes, right, it's all based on every bout going the full length time. Yes. Right? So yes. when someone gets knocked out in the first round, does that just give you like, all right, we can like, kind of let her hair down for a second, you know, to be like on top of it, or would you kind of scoop people up a little bit so you'd have a little time later, or? Well, I had to be on guard because they had pay-per-view or television time. So if they saw that they had extra time to do something, maybe. Well, the promo. Yeah, yeah, yes. Or maybe Dana's birthday or, or your birthday or somebody, or let's talk about this. And they would always tell the, the stage manager to tell me, I always told them I needed, that's all I needed was five minutes. I would memorize the schedule, but I still needed five minutes. If you started at 404 and your fight was supposed to go to 428 and by 406, that fight was done because you had a first round knockout or whatever, then we had about 15 or 20 minutes, supposedly. But then in the truck or someplace else, they might decide to change that schedule and flip it around. And they would let me know. But you guys you never. You have like a headset on, right? Uh, no. I never wore a headset what? because what? I didn't like it. But I had my guys, all my guys. How you would have a headset on. Yes. Had on headsets or walkies. And I communicated back and forth with them. But the one thing I never wanted to do that if I let them, they would have. I never, ever had you guys in a holding area more than two minutes or more than three minutes. Didn't want that to happen. Like in the... In the, the holding gauntlet. area, in the walkout. When you left the dress room and you stood there, blue corner and red corner, I made sure you never stood in that holding area more than five minutes. Now, if right. you think about it, you know, it... it but if I, if I didn't control that or paid attention to that you, you would have been or a fighter would have been could have been you know if they had a first round knockout and was preparing for the the the, the regular three rounds you know or the 28 minutes they would say bring a guy to the holding area bring a guy to the holding area bring him in bring him in i would say when are we starting bring him in bring him in no i'm not bringing him in when are we starting I would make them give me a time so that I would at least not be running back and forth and have you guys sitting in the holding area. And believe me, I learned that the hard way. But I I learned everything once. <laughs> okay. That holding area, I don't know. I can say for a fighter or as a quarterman, that holding area, you can cut that tension with like a fucking knife. Yeah. It and is. Oh. Man, it's like, because I'd be there, I'd be probably like, 25, 30 yards, my opponent would be like, yes. waiting to go through the thing, but there was like, like he said, there was like a couple minutes where I would just be like a fucking tiger on that guy. Like, if you look over here, just know I'm going to fucking eat you. And your corner's kind of behind you. They're just like, yeah, yeah, you know, pop up. Yeah, Their corner's kind of looking at them like, uh -huh, fuck you uh -huh. guys. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. What you looking at? What you looking at? Yeah, it yeah. It is yeah. like the most... Oh, Man, I am so like, glad. So, my question is, like, when you would be walking through there, would you be like, oh, damn. You can, like, feel it in the air. I don't know if it's the same for you because you're working and you're... Yeah. Well, you if, 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 if you notice, you know, I always, I always, I was always at a high level. My intensity level was okay. always as much as yours, as much Wait, as you oh, got. Yes. I used and to feed off that shit. That was a question I had for you, Dennis. Do you remember? I don't know if it's going to be the same. Uh, everybody, everybody, you know, I, I, I use that because I also wanted to get you guys fired up, you know, because I needed you fired up. I needed you to stay fired up. I didn't need you because you spent a lot of time in that dressing room. You guys were in their dressing room two and a half hours. I didn't need that to feel like two and a half hours. Okay. I needed that. I didn't that. Like I didn't and and <laughs> so... When you guys got in the holding area, it was probably the most intense time ever. 
and I would walk and look each one of you right in the eye. I would put each one of you right in front of me, right in front of me. If you're pacing back and forth, I'd pace with you because I needed <laughs> me to be your focus and not everybody else around you. Right. Because like you said, you standing there and your opponent's right there. You wanted to eat him right there. <laughs> and, in my head, Bert would come in my locker like, we rolling! <laughs> like, get that money. I'm like, he wants me to win. He's looking in the eyes. He wants me to win. I just know. I'm like, fuck this other guy. Bert's on my team. For real. Your night, your fight, get it right, baby. Yeah. You know? But Where did these slogans come from? You just over time? Just, just over time, I, I, you know, ain't but two, him and you. You know, this is what we're no, doing while no, we, we do it, baby. You know, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, that was, can I say that? On, yeah, you can say what you can curse. It was, you it was, what, what happened was, and there was a fight, and it was, I think, maybe BJ Penn and George St. Pierre or, or one of them, the official said one of the guys had too much Vaseline on. So I had to go and rub it down and take it off of him in the middle. And I wasn't going to let that happen again. So that's why I told everybody. I said, listen, I told the corner man, because guys, you know, they have that a way. Hey, you know, up under here, up under here, in between the finger, behind the ears, you know. And I'd say, listen, you know, I don't want anybody, anybody in this room to have any Vaseline. I don't want Vaseline on your hand, on your back, in your crack, on your ears, up your nose. I don't want Vaseline, petroleum jelly, KY jelly, peanut butter and jelly, Ben Gay, Gay Ben, fish grease, fish and grits, fish oil, nothing. <laughs> I just got myself sick. <laughs> And but, yeah, but you would just say that repeat sometimes twice a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, you know what? That was a fun way of telling you that I don't want you to have Vaseline at the cake. The point was very clear. No Vaseline. And 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 I had to I had to figure out a good way to tell you that because guys kept it. Guys came in with Vaseline. You know, in a, in, some of them had the small, some of them had the big jar, but it was in there. And they used it for other things. But I wanted you to know that I was watching for it on your back, in your crack, under your arm, up your nose. Don't do it. So I just, I, I have no idea. I didn't sit down and write that script out. Trust me. <laughs> it, just, it just, it came. But we, you know, you guys all knew it. And guys adhered to it. And if I saw it, sometimes I'd be walking in the, in the holding area. That's why I had everybody together. I'd walk by, I'd look in the bucket. I'd check a guy's, you know, his mouthpiece, check his gloves, check the other guy's gloves. I always put your gloves in my hand just to feel. Because I've, I've had guys. In boxing, right? Yes. Put Vaseline on gloves. I've had guys have Vaseline inside. Or the hand wrap, just, just you know, for whatever reason. But I learned that. But I also learned a lot of that stuff since the time I was with Joe Frazier and being in the gym with Joe Frazier and all of his sons and his nephews and his daughter and Muhammad Ali's daughter and 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 just working in different gyms. I got to see. Because I actually came from the fashion industry. That's where I first started. I went to, I went to FIT. I, you know, I went to school for fashion designing. Yeah. And, you know, so that transition from that to MMA was, or boxing was. But I'm going to tell you, when I went back from fashion to boxing, I went back to the hood, baby. Because it was, it was all gut. <laughs> you know, in the gym, man, the stuff I saw in the gym and the stuff the guys used to do in the gym and the fights that the guys had, but it was a part of the culture. It was a part of the system. Right. You know, I had to learn that these were fighters. The trainers were fighters. 
you know, and, 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 and that's what, but when I came from boxing to MMA, it was a total different world. Yeah. You guys in MMA, and, and I've said this a couple of times, and I've made a couple of boxing people around me mad, but it was a different, it was a totally different. The majority of the guys, huh? Apples and oranges, they're both fighting. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, but, but it was, I mean, you guys, you guys train in each other's gym. You guys use one guy for grappling, one guy for stand-up, one guy for jiu-jitsu. You know, you, you share gyms. Yeah. And you might share the gym with a guy you're going to fight. Yeah. That didn't happen in boxing. If you had a gym, you stayed in your gym. If your gym was on Fifth Street, you didn't go on A Street. You stayed on Fifth Street. And then when I got to MMA, I came there with that attitude that I got to really watch these guys and keep it. But when these guys, you know, they were the same workouts and, 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 and very respectful. But the martial arts and, and, and wrestling, you, you, guys were, you, you guys taught to work with each other. You were taught to work out with, you, with each other. And, the, the respect was, it was a whole different world. It was two different worlds. I came from boxing from the hood where it was, you know what? If you brought your grandma in there, she, she better know how to fight. I mean, for me, it's just common sense off the jump. I don't care what realm. Like, yeah, I'm going to fight this guy. I want to get paid to do it. So to right. do it for free out in the open and, and maybe get the fight canceled is just insane to me. Like... I, I don't think you ever talked about this, Dennis. Have you ever fought someone you trained with? Um, I no, 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 no. And and that was that was that was you know it it it. Uh, I have had situations where guys fought guys that they trained with. I can't remember right off the top of my head, but I always sat down and had conversations with you guys and I always say fighting for free hurts for nothing and it's over and it's overrated so you don't do that shit for free not when you can get paid for it but I would always sit down and talk to you guys when you came in and I got to know the guys that worked out with each other the guys that didn't necessarily I won't say get along but listen man I'm gonna I'm gonna fight this guy a year from now I'd rather not be in the same workout room I listened to that stuff. And that's yeah, the way yeah. I set up the workout rooms and the dressing rooms, especially the dressing room. You yeah. guys never went to a dressing room and didn't want to go in. But if you had walked into a dressing room and there was a guy's name on there that maybe you had just fought it, you're getting ready to fight, something would, something would draw you to see that. And I, I got to know that during the course of the week so that by the end of the week, when I made the dressing rooms up, I had to, I had that in mind. I had to have that in mind. And that's how I had, because very few arenas were set up for MMA. Oh, were, yeah. The dressing rooms were all set up for boxing. Because boxing, they, you stand up and you hit the mitts. You didn't have to lay down and no sharp edges. Right. and You had to have a lot of space to roll. I got there with MMA, and I'm like, uh, where are your dressing rooms? You're in it. Okay. And I'm like, this is not going to work. How am I going to, you know, but you know what? I had to make it work. I had to make it work. When they, when they brought me there, the one thing that Dana White or no one ever did, they always left it up to me and never questioned what I, what I did or how I did it. All right. But when they came there, it needed to be right. And you guys with the same thing with you guys, you well, know. I don't think it's like if I'm fighting you, right? If you have the same dressing room as I do, and it's there, and we're both preparing the same area, you know, it's if yes. one guy has this huge room, the other guy doesn't. That's where you know it'd be a little weird. Yeah. Well, I made sure that it was, you know, it it worked out, or you guys didn't get to see it, and I made sure that you guys, you know, no one knew what everyone else was going on. Because there was a period, too, Stan, you probably don't know this, where, like, the undercard would fight, and then, he, like, we'd be kind of kicked out of the locker room so like, the main event could come in and use those same locker rooms. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah and 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 that was that was that was being creative with the spaces you know and that was also the the that was not a good situation but but the best part of that situation was it gave credence to and reason why I needed tickets for you guys to go sit down and watch the right right you know I said what am I going to do with these guys you know the, there's no there's not enough space I can't have them sit in there you got because they never had less than 10 fights on a card. Right. That's, that's 20 guys, 20 fighters. Each right. fighter with a minimum of three people. So that's, you know, and when you guys came in and sat down in a dressing room, you spread out. One guy in MMA took up three spaces that they would in fighting because you guys spread it out. And you sat down and you guys needed to roll around in that little area that you were in. So I had to I had to get very creative with it. But I did. I made it I made it work and and that was the last thing you needed on your head. Yeah. I always said ain't but two, him and you. So I didn't need you to get that on your head. The dress rooms were too small or they were too cold. You know, I always made sure temperature was from 63 and higher. After, after I would fight, there was always someone in the crowd that like, yo, come sit with me. Like, there's there's extra, you know, you know, if it wasn't a sold out arena. I know, I remember Connor versus uh, Chad Mendez. I had to watch it from the, because it, it was sold out. There wasn't even like. Up, probably up, up, up in the. No, I had to watch it from the locker room. I got you. I got you. Yeah, there well, wasn't even a seat to, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, the growth of the sport was, was and still is phenomenal. I, 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 I mean, I had never seen a thing grow as fast. And my first boxing event ever was March 8th, 1971. And Joe Frazier fought Muhammad Ali in New York. Madison Square Garden. And that was huge. But then I came to MMA, but then I but then in between, I did De La Hoya, I did the Klitschko Brothers, I did Roy Jones, I did Bernard Hopkins, I worked with Tito Trinidad, I did Tyson's last wow. six six fights. I did Tyson's last six fights. And I got to MMA and didn't know what it was. I'm going to tell you, man, that thing had legs from the beginning. From the beginning. The first, maybe from UFC 30 to UFC 35, 40 or so, it started. It started. And it just, I remember the first big event, or, or the one I remember because I ran my legs off, was in Toronto, I think it was, was it the Rogers okay. Center? It was 55,000 people or 53,000, whatever. Round but that up. was, that Round was, down. man, that was, that was, that was crazy. And, and I had to, I had to literally run that arena by myself. And that was, and when I say by myself, because the guys that I brought on, it was kind of new to them, and they were just getting things done and watching and you, you guys. You want done right, right? You do it yourself. Uh, so uh, you want this shit to run like purpose. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you do it? Oh, you know what? I'll just do it. I'll just, you know. <laughs> I, well, you know what? It was, it was, it had to be. It, there were times that I might have, you know, done maybe a little more than I needed to, but you know what? I was. I was already there. Right. You know, it's like, man, you're in the middle of the round. You don't you don't stop when you don't hear the bell. You know, they, they, they tell you to keep your hands up at all times and you keep going at all times. You right. just don't because he stopped. You figure, oh, I'm going to walk away. You that turn around because hey, that judge going to make you cry. <laughs> Never, ever, ever, ever leave it to the judges. You leave it to the judges. I can guarantee you, son, they'll make you cry. Uh, but I knew that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I know. I, I, but I always said it. I always told y'all. 
Don't leave that shit to the judges. I tried my best to not leave it to the judges. Don't leave it to the judges. So, so we talked about it a lot, like with guys are getting paid in the UFC and stuff like that. And Stan's got Stan has this reference where he says the UFC or MMA is still in the leather helmets era of football. Okay. In terms of Would pain. you say where where were they, were they or when are when are the UFC fighters gonna make it NFL money, if ever? Well, you know, there's a lot of variables in that now. In the day and age of television and television money and, and what promoters get from get out of their television contracts, you know, it's it's I remember during the era in boxing when you had Mike Tyson, you had Evander Holyfield, or when you had Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran and during those era or 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 the De La Hoya era, you had maybe four boxers making ninety percent of the money, or five boxers making ninety percent of the money. I did a Tyson fight where Tyson maybe got five, ten million, and there was a guy on that card that got a hundred dollars a round and yeah. fought a four round fight. Per round? They get paid boxers? That's well, yeah. back then. They still back do that. Then they got it's crazy. Say it Boxing, again. They, they still do that, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay. I, I would I would imagine like that. If you're a feeder? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like you're oh, going yeah. Down here, they, oh yeah. You know. They got they got I remember when they got $35, 50 dollars a round. Then it went to fifty. Then it went to a hundred dollars a round. And then you had the guy, the main card, making five million dollars. And here's a guy that fought a four round fight and got four hundred dollars. And they might have taken some money out of that for food, possibly. But then I came to MMA, and the the the, the money was a lot less. But it seemed like everybody was making about the same thing. Now, I'm going back from 2000 to 2016, where it started it, around maybe 2010. Ronda had a $3 million dollar fight. Yeah, then it started going a little. But then it was still pretty balanced out where, you know, guys making $3 million. The lower end of the guy was making maybe $15,000, 10000 or You know, it wasn't, it wasn't $4 million. The 400. <laughs> right. Okay. It wasn't like that. I, I don't know exactly what it is now. I know what I hear and what, what I, but I always thought that the pay scale was comparable across the board. I agree. Because there was nobody making five, 10 million and a guy down here making 500. Now, what are your thoughts on the pay scale being based off of your following? Because that's the thing. I don't agree with that. Me neither. Well, but that's that's that is, with that question, the pay scale is never going to change. It's a great, it's a tough yeah. topic to talk about, and they'll never get to the NFL or NBA level two ways, <laughs> unless they get a union or unless they can amend the Ali Act to go to box to go to MMA. And even then, you see boxing still fucked up too. Where like Floyd Mayweather can say, "No, I want more money," or "I want the lion's share" because he's such a big name. But he got fucked to get to that big name. You know what I mean? Like boxing still and, really fucked up. Like NFL. And that's what I said. E even back in my day, it was it was the disparity was. I told you there was three or four guys making eighty five to ninety percent of the money, yeah. which it was. Yeah. You know, and the, and the Muhammad Ali Act, it came out. And, and, you know, I don't want to be totally quoted on it, but I think the, initially that was for disclosure yes. because yes. fighters and, and they had no idea about how much money the promoter was making, how much money he was being paid by the television or nothing like that. So I guess, so they started, you know what, let's just start disclosing that and, and giving an idea so we'll know how to negotiate. So the Muhammad Ali Act, came out and it, it was for disclosure and, and it, it brought all of that to the surface. Will the will will the will MMA or boxing or whatever get to NBA money and NFL money? I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, I, I'm I agree with you and I think another reason too is because like 
some of those dudes can be in the NBA for 20 years. You can't fight professionally for 20 years. But but not only not only that, Dennis, but the but the the, 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 the television contracts and the television money and the sponsorship money for the NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball is so huge. Yeah. And you don't have that same kind of sponsorship and television revenue. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, in, in time. Well, yeah, it, a way it, you it, can it, look it, at it, too, is the UFC is equivalent to the size of probably one team. Like I, if the I, UFC I sold for $4 billion, the Yankees are probably worth more than $4 billion. You know what I mean? One team. Yes. Yeah, one team. Yeah. One yes. good team. Like, there's probably other teams that are worth less than a million, a billion or whatever, but... One team. So think of Bert, think of a, wait, wait, think of a baseball team. They have twenty five or forty guys on their roster. That's forty millionaires. How many guys on the UFC roster? Six hundred. So they would need to you know how many times over do they need to get over that four billion mark? You know, those guys, you know? those guys making forty million and twenty million and thirty million a year. And I I saw I saw just the, this morning. I saw with the top five quarterbacks. We're making in the NFL, and the lowest, the lowest was thirty-three million, up to forty-five million a year. You know, it, the start it's, of it would be a union, though. You guys had a union, yes. then you guys can go. Yeah. All right, that four billion, at least two billion of it's ours to split up amongst us. Or well, how much you, you guys, guys are in and here? out so often? You know what I mean? They tried. They tried. Uh, maybe back in two thousand and four. Or, or, or 2005, I remember a group of guys got together and was trying to put together a oh, fighters' well, union. Oh, did not like yeah. that. Everyone and got blackballed did. pretty much, yeah. Uh, that's why I didn't mention no names. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, they were. They, they, they t definitely didn't. But the guys had gotten together, and there was about four of them that started. And they started, and, and it started to catch on. and and But, you know... You, you got to have consistency. You got to have leadership, and you got to have people that are determined to get the job done for yeah. something like that to succeed. Yeah. Because if you don't have that, you're not going to get to the forty and fifty million dollars a year. Yeah, and they take care of the champions, I'm sure. So what it would take probably is John Jones, Connor, Poirier, like some big names that they have right now, being like, "Yeah, I'm not fighting next month." Sign, give yeah. us this amount of money. Like it would take big names to sign on. I remember and they, they, they'd have to be consistent, consistent with it and support. Yeah, you know it, it's it's not going to happen if just one guy is running. Then they're going to say, it, "Oh, he just running his mouth." So let's just shut him up. Okay, we just won't give him another fight, or we just won't. You know, it, it's it's. But I, I've always been one that that that. You know, organizing together and working together has always been in my culture. Uh, it's always been in my head and in my brain. And, you know, but the guys have to have to want to do it together and not just get that paycheck and go home. You know, I got mine. You get yours. It's if you if you if it stays like that, it's not going to it's not going to happen. What you sh should do is do like. If you're in the UFC still after 10 fights with like, yeah, if you're still in the UFC after 10 fights, like, all right, now you're this next, like, you're going to be but, around. You know what, you know what they do? And I, and I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but I knew, I know that they paid bonuses based on the amount of fights that you had. I mean, there was a $50,000 bonus for the winner or whatever, but there was other Right, when they brought on Reebok, I think, or, or some of the other sponsorship, they started giving sponsorship money and bonuses based on the amount of fights that you had and how long you had been in the UFC. Before was, Reebok? This was, I, 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 I don't want to get it totally wrong, but I, I, I think even now that guys are getting a certain kind of bonus that's based on the amount of fights and the amount of time they've been in the UFC. 
I don't yeah. know exactly that's what it is. That's what you did with Reebok, but now yes. they haven't unveiled Venom, which is going to be their new apparel company. I don't know why. Yes. Not yet. I, I heard that. I heard that Venom was was, but but Venom has has been around for a long time, and Reebok beat them out because they were they they they're not they didn't just come to the world of MMA or, or just started. They've been they've been around. I remember they were number three in basketball for twenty years in my head. Yeah, for a minute. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Reebok, yes. yeah, so probably... No, Reebok, but not Venom. I'm like, Venom's got to be emptying the bank account to, oh, to yeah, not be Venom, sponsored not. the UFC. Yeah. Well, Venom has Venom. A, Venom just did a big contract with Walmart. So I'd imagine that's where they got that nut if they gave the UFC something, you know? I was about to say that somewhere along the line, they've got some partnerships somewhere to be able to, to take over a Reebok contract. Yeah. Uh, but you know, again, sometimes, and I'll say this is that sometimes you pay for names or branding, and sometimes the name and a branding doesn't always say there's a ton of money behind it. You I know, a brand has been established. Yeah, I think this whole thing is probably total control for the UFC, they don't have to deal with Reebok. And Reebok is like a subsidiary of Adidas now, and they don't have to deal with really seven or six people answering their thing. It's probably Dana with one phone call to the Venom guy, like, this is what I need. This is what I want. I this is what we're doing. We're going to design it. It's not Reebok designing the UFC well, press kit. Well, I, I, knowing, knowing Dana White like I know him, I don't think it was ever too much any other way with anybody. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that even with, even with, with Reebok, because there was a couple of times, and I, I, I remember when when Reebok first came in and started just a little at a time. I got a couple of pairs. You know, they just started one meeting, two meetings. Then they started wanting the fighters to come to the meeting, and then the fighters started balking a little bit because they didn't want to. They they didn't. Why do we have to have a meeting in the middle of the week for some clothing? Right. You know, that was their thing to me, and. I was absolutely the right person to listen, but the wrong person to hear. Okay, because I, you know, there was, you know, I was told that this is the direction that we're going, and the fighters need to be there, and whatever you need to do to put it in their schedule, it needs to be in their schedule. Yeah. You know what? I did that. And then you probably have. They started getting bills. like a little weird towards the end there. Like at least on my like. Like if a, if a trainer went down there and got like another pair of shoes, whatever, they would like take it off your like. Really, your yeah, off your money, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, I'm like, yeah, they start getting like very nitpicky. I'm like, dude, you guys, uh, you guys good? You guys so, hurt or like? So 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 I left and the shit just fell apart. Okay, I hear you. <laughs> I remember yeah. being like, oh, man, like, my shoes are soaked from cutting weight. Like, can I get another pair of shoes to wear out? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, no, like, it, hooked, it, they hooked it up. But you know I'm like, sweetheart. They're like, put like, yeah, don't yeah. tell anyone. But initially, initially, they were giving that stuff away. When, yeah. when, when that Reebok deal first started, you know, I was a little pissed because they actually had a a one of the one of the rooms. Like, if I, if I went to an arena – and I had eight rooms to work with for dressing rooms. Now I only had seven because one room was the Reebok room and they gave you whatever you went in there and you got until it ran out. They had a pack for everybody, but then the extra stuff, they wanted everybody to wear. So anybody that went in there, you know, not that they were just throwing stuff, but then that kind of changed a little, got a little different as time went on and it, 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 it kind of backed up a little bit, but, I can guarantee you they made they sold that business for four four billion dollars. Yeah. They made some money. Trust me. Yeah. What uh what is Burt doing now? What's Burt Watson doing now? Are you still with CFFC? No. Uh well what happened was there was an organization that came along called Alliance. And the job 
what alliance the objective was to take all of the regional promoters promotions that they can put them under one umbrella and you know compete with the ufc for space television venues and so i joined alliance and they they brought us cffc and all of that and then in between that they they started chopping different organizations off and different managers off so i stayed but i stayed with alliance because number one it was i was tired of traveling at the time i was tired of traveling i wanted to stay home i live in philadelphia and i wanted to stay in philly so i did and eventually when the alliance d- dissolved they 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 put their money in somebody's wrong hands because that money disappeared okay the money disappeared so I decided at that time I said you know what I'm going to do what I do but I need to use my own name. So I started Burt Watson Promotions and I did my first promotion in Fort Lauderdale in 2019 June with the very first fight that I promoted that I had under Burt Watson Promotion. I did my own. And from that fight I actually We were 300 people shy of a sellout in that arena yeah. which was excellent for your first fight. Yeah. And I got four dates from from that one fight because it was a success level. The first date was supposedly last year March 13th, June 12th, September 25th and this February 13th. But we all know COVID came along. Mm. We and were on your own show as well. Me yes, it, it just shot it just chopped everything down so i ended up staying at home and i couldn't travel uh couldn't get on a plane so you know because i was home i started doing my i do what you guys do i started doing a podcast called legends to legends and it's uh where i sit and i talk with legends such as yourself guys I'm ready to come on whenever you want guys that are are well, well you owe me one now <laughs> yep. so, you know with, with guys who have been in and out of the sport and you know I've done uh I got one out now with Rampage I did uh Vitor Belford I did Randy Couture uh and uh that's what I'm doing now and it's on MMA Junkie and it's called Legends to Legend and that's that's basically what I'm doing but whatever I do from here on is under Burt, Burt Watson Promotions because only thing I got left baby is my name and it's yeah. my night it's my fight I got to get it right baby that's that's basically what I'm doing but because of the way things are now everybody is doing the best that they can from a location even all the television shows now are all being streamed yeah. yard or streamed out you know so but I'm you know I'm excited about it uh I'm looking to get some sponsors and put some things together you know and but as soon as we can get out of this house and get on the road i got 10 good years left baby and i'm going to use every one of them. and yeah every one of them you have a home here on menace and the man always we would love to do story time with bert anything you ever want yeah, to do my drop us i love that down. i love that there's the menace yeah. i love that but so obviously it, you still watch fighting right yes Yes. Like, I, well, were you, were I, you a fan of it before you got into it or you became a fan or I was I was I was a fan of boxing. I was a fan of boxing and then when I transitioned from boxing to MMA, I became a fan. And I became a fan because it the, the guys, you know, fighters have a fraternity. And they only let certain people in there. And you guys let me in there. and i loved it i became an automatic fan my 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 grandkids are fan i got five grandchildren man uh and and they're all fan my granddaughters they any all fighters? watch fighters any potential fighters no, or no 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 my well my my son but he got too big my son is 64 and he weighs like about right now probably about 280 You know, maybe 300 pounds. I don't know where the hell that came from, but he's mine, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I do know that. But, he, but uh, he played he played football. He played okay. football. 
He was pretty good. And right now, he coaches. Tell you how he is now a he is now the head wrestling coach at Ridgewood High in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Okay. And my other daughter is a advisor in Patterson, New Jersey. So they're all educators and they all work in athletics. So my whole family is, is in and involved. And I'm, I'm sure you remember my wife. She was at every single fight, sitting in the front row and cheering. I, I never knew who she was cheering for, but she was rolling <laughs> and knew everybody. No, because we were talking about boxing. You don't go to the same gym. So Usman versus Gilbert Burns just happened this past weekend. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, because you know both those guys a little bit, right? Yes. That was, for me, I'm sitting there like, I don't. So I was, just because I had gotten up early Saturday, I had my kids, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I'm watching the fight. I'm, I'm into them, but I just, like, I like kind of dozed off, right? I kind of come to, and it's Gilbert and Usman walking out. I'm like, all right, I'm so, I'm kind of like uh, doing this. The fight happens. I'm up till 4 o'clock in the morning. Like, dude, what the fuck? Wow. Like, my, like, that fight happening, I was just like, I think because the emotional ties and the actual fight itself, yes. I was like, yes. holy shit. Well, you, you become emotionally involved, and, and, and I've been in it long enough to see you guys develop. And to see, I mean, I was in when you came in as a rookie and you retired doing, the, you know, and, and that's the life I've had, and I've seen the guys. So, you know, my love for the sport you know, it, it just grows and it keeps going. And, and I see these guys fighting and the hype they get for the fight. And I usually, I, I, I can tell and I know. Let me tell you something. Sometimes with anybody, when the lights go on, some people's lights go out. Yes. Yeah. They can, get, too. they can get dim, but they shouldn't go out. Sometimes you got a fight where a guy, Conor McGregor, is used to them lights being on. And he did it real quick. They'll, they'll never go out. Somebody else that's fighting him or anybody of that level could get in there and them lights could, those lights go out real quick. Okay? You know, because the lights are so bright. And that, that has a real effect. It's like your first fight in the UFC. I, if you can remember what that was like. Yeah. And the first time I screamed in your ear that we was rolling. You know, it, it's those lights are on. Your lights got to stay on. But sometimes the lights go on and some people's lights go on. It's all right to get dim, but they can't go out. And that is a natural fact. So yes. you always pay attention to that. And a lot of people don't pay attention to it. And, you know, they call fights one way or another. But there's a lot to say for a guy being to fight in the UFC or Bellator or PFL, you know, or, or LFA. There's a lot to fighting. And the bigger the lights, not the arena, not the crowd, the brighter the lights, Dimmer the wall. Bert, when's the book coming out? I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you, he's seen it all. He, you know what I mean? Like, when you say that, I'm, I'm working with the guy. Just, I am, I'm going to tell you my, I'm 72 years old, bro. And I, and I just sat down with the guy not too long ago to, to, to talk about doing a book. And is, is it's, the title it's a lot. Going to be babysitted to the stars? Uh-huh. I haven't thought I thought I haven't thought of that yet. You know. Uh, is it a biography? Is it you Well, it's, it's gonna be a com here? it's gonna be a combination a combination of both. Because okay. just like I'm sitting and talking to you guys, I've got stories to tell, I think, and and I learned a lot of lessons that I can give that I can give out and I can I can express, you know. I've always learned that nothing anybody says to me is irrelevant. If you say it to me, it's because you want me to hear it. Not just to listen, but I need to hear it. Because when you hear it, you digest it. Right. And there's lessons in that. And, you know, that's what, what I, I, 
if I were, you know, to lay out a book or to put things out, I, I, I'd like it to be lessons. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the one thing that I've gotten in my life. Organizing it. Yes. And it's like, uh, where do it's, you start? It, it, it is. But um, it, it, a good thing about that, I'm a hood rat. So I know how to I know how to host shit, you know. It's it's it it's easier, you know. And 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 when you when you know how how to be, men in general, are very creative when it comes to certain things. You know what I'm talking about. You know you get very creative. You learn how you know. No doesn't mean no. You get slapped to the left, you duck <laughs> around, and you come back up to the right, smiling, skinning, and grinning. You know, because that creativity works. Oh, no, stop, stop, <laughs> no, no, oh, no. you know. But there's, there's a, there's a, there's a lot, you know, and I've, uh, I've seen a lot, and a lot of uh, uh, things that, you know, people ask me sometimes, what some of the greatest fights I've ever been to, or some. I think one of the biggest things I, for me, is to, to have seen the growth of female athletes in this sport. Yeah. That was amazing for me, man. And I, I, I sat back and watched it. But I, I always heard that that would never happen. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I remember watching while I was playing, like, audio. That yeah. would never be it, would, it, would, it, would, it would never happen. It would never happen. It would never be. And the, the, the women that I saw develop and the way that I saw, you know, that I when, – when by, when by the time the women came in, because when MMA first started, I come from boxing. You know, you throw a jab. You know, MMA wasn't they wasn't straight jabbing, and 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 they wow. knew how to stand up. You learned how to you learned how to hit the pad and hit the mess. When women came in, they already it was like they knew they were they were standing up and boxing and striking and pop 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 and going to town. The bell would ring. They met in the middle of the ring, and they didn't leave that middle of the ring until the bell rang again. Yeah. I when I when I train people, like if you give me a girl that's never boxed and a guy that never boxed, I want to train the girl all day long because she'll get it way quicker because she's not trying to kill the bitch. She's listening to you. She's not like guys like what I don't know, and they're just like like bro, relax. Yeah, you like don't know this. what you're doing. Yeah, right. You yeah, and you don't it's, know it's what absolutely annoying. Let me but, tell you, and then show me that you listen. You know? Right, right. Yeah, but who's I, my I, jab I, this past weekend? Yes. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Well, it, well and good. that's what I just that's what I just said. You guys, the guys learned how when UFC 30, 31, they was hitting like this. And I know they're gonna be mad at me, but I don't care. That's okay. Right. But then they went from this to this. I oh. mean, I see now, I see guys in there now. I mean, you don't know whether they're boxers or MMA guys because they got they got the technical skill levels are unbelievable. It's jab, 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 boom, and right. then you go boom, boom, and then you get to, you got to put hands on. Them. Right now, I had a decent jab. I just have short arms. <laughs> like Usman's arms are so long and he uses range so efficiently with the footwork. It's just like man. Yeah, you know the what? one's coming out. Quick, early, and I was like, "Oh, this." Well, is like well, again, the lights came on, and I when 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 that bell rang, Burns was out there. Right. You got five more to go, baby. Right, I did and, see that. I was like, and, and that wasn't was like, that. That wasn't usually him. He wasn't usually like like that, you know. But he did he come and out you know, like, yeah. And you know what it did? What it does when you have a guy come at you real quick, right away it puts you in a in a defensive, you know. And you're resting because you're stopping it. You're stopping it, you know. And and he came out real quick. And what was it? Third round or whatever? Third round, yeah, it was the. Uh, you know, Tom said yeah, that's yeah. how the sparring used to go. Gilbert would come with these wild hooks, sometimes catch him. But for the most part, he said he would just be sticking Gilbert with those long jabs and those straights, and Gilbert's a little bit more wild. Yeah. I thought Gilbert that. would have hit, caught him and 
had a little more. He gets that opportunity again. Gilbert gets that opportunity again. I can tell you it would be different. And everybody says it. Give me an opportunity again. It'll be different. I know now. I understand. And, you know, you only understand when it's over, when it's done. Uh, uh, Usman, I, 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 I was amazed, you know. I mean, some guys, you know, you jab and you keep you keep that out there. You can't jab and keep this out there. You gotta you gotta keep going, man. You gotta keep this back. <laughs> yeah. Because you either keep it back or keep it down. One of the two. You you don't put the ball put it all out, out there. But you know, I I I think and and I think he understood his pace. He said I heard him in an interview say something about he rushed or he, said he, he was went, out there. He went Cody Galbraith. He said he rocked Is that him what early. He said? he said he went full blown Cody Garbrandt. He said he rocked <laughs> him early and then just started swinging too heavy. And he said he was blown up and gassed by the first round. You know. Well, I remember like it was like a quarter of the way in the second round. He like stopped for a second and he was like, and I was like, oh shit! I think he's processing. Like I'm kind of tired now. Yeah. And then right you know? after, I know the moment you're talking. And then he threw that lazy jab out there and. Usman went, oh, here's a two right over the top. Boom. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that, 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 that's, that's called the take it with you. Because you throw that jab and somebody will say, yeah, take this with you. Take okay. this back. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Bob, I've, you know, Brian Stan and Vitor Belfort and maybe a little bit of, of Vandalay. I think the quickest hands that I've seen and hand speed. Brian and, Stan up there? Huh? Brian yeah. Stan's on that list? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've, because when I say hand speed, you know, guys, your hand, you need that hand speed when somebody's coming in at you. When somebody, the, the jab is not, it's not always speed. It's reach and distance and connecting. And once you hit a guy with a jab, you can almost keep it out there because right. you got you got that range. You got it. You got it. And he's going to be a little timid. But that range from here to here, that's hand speed. Not always from here to there. If you notice Muhammad Ali, you know, he was the, the only was guy. Right. Yes. But he was the only guy I knew that threw a jab and reached. He reached out. I mean, but he did it because he did this and he did this real easy, real easy. And then what he did, he did this and this and he backed up. You know, he shuffled back a little bit and had his had his hands up. But I put Brian, I, Brian's, there was one fight I forgot who he had that backed him up against the rope, against the cage. And I think I counted 90 punches. <laughs> That Brian uh, Stan, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Lieben or Vandalay or. I know Brian I know. Stan and Vandalay had a fight of the year where they sat in front of each other and just went punch for punch. Okay, okay, maybe that was maybe that was it. Who would you say that is? Vitor, what's huh? up? Who would you say that is? It's Vandalay versus. Uh, they had a fight of the year. Yes. Right. They stole it from me and Matt Christ. <laughs> Maybe wow. Alessio Sakara. The Alessio Sakara fight I remember was like a crazy, crazy, crazy. And then crazy. Him, versus, him versus Chris Lieben was one of those too, where he just threw it off. That's what it was, yeah. Lieben. It was Lieben. He fought Lieben, and that's where I get that. That when I when I put him up there, I'm I, you know I, I threw out three names because those were the first three that come to my mind with the hand speed, you know that really, really, really used it. And Vitor, I mean... I just punched the camera and came back right. You can't see it. <laughs> you know, Vitor was one of those guys that, that you know, he, he had pretty he had pretty good pretty good hand, hand speed. I'd have to watch a Brian Stan fight to remember, but even you named Vitor and Anderson. Those are two of the greatest counterfighters, counterpunchers of all time. Like this, oh, yeah. the second you cross the line, it's like bing, 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 and you're like, oh, <laughs> shit, I got hit three times. Right, because like it's you know, like I said, that, that right there, that's that that's that's the speed. The speed is not from here to there; it's from here to there. It's that that short, it's that short distance, you know. It, it's it's 
they used to teach guys it's like catching flies you know like when you catch a fly you don't you don't do this when you catch a fly you catch it you catch it. pop it's pop pop you know and and it's it's a very short distance in that but uh man i love i love it i love it i love you know i watch it now i you know i catch it as much as i can very often do i pay for it <laughs> yeah i'm not i feel like we, i should be given like a coat yeah 100%. Uh, 100%. Well, well, not, it, not that i give the coat out to other people but for me my own personal you know they took my fight pass well let me tell you let me tell you something uh Dana said I think I heard Dana say he's chasing people like that <laughs> and he's catching them. Imagine if oh, imagine if Dennis pirated the UFC and they arrested Dennis Bermudez for piracy of the UFC. It's like my blood's been on the canvas, dude. What the wow. fuck are we doing here? Wow. Wow. Dennis Bermudez hijacks hijacks 259. One funny thing <laughs> is Dana White said something like I don't do that. Before the Connor fight, they were like they asked Dana again about Dana the whole piracy thing, what are you going to do? And Dana White was like, I have a guy. I'm waiting for the guy to go live. So many people are probably like, oh, my God. I, is it me? Is it me? He and he, he actually said that that guy they were looking for didn't do it this last fight. He, he said that the guy that we were chasing, he kind of got away from us because this last fight we didn't see. Somehow they've got – but they have always had something like that because – UFC 52, I think it was, went in the dark. And when I say went in the dark, they were on pay-per-view. They were live. And I think I think Randy Couture was fighting or somebody. But that went in the dark from the, from the first fight on the pay-per-view. From that point on, they, they started watching. Because they thought that it, they lost it because of the piracy, and that was that was that was a long, long time ago. But I'll never forget that. That I remember Dana and Lorenzo walking into the back. They were beat red, and I asked them what had happened, and I just heard that they had lost the effing signal. I didn't know what they were talking about because I still had guys go to the holding area, but. You know, from that point on, I think they started they started watching. Now, uh, Bert, you say you watch fights still. Are you st are you current with the new guys coming in, or they have to like get to a certain point and then catch your eye? They've got. I, I am I am I am lost with a lot of the new guys coming in. I saw the roster of of, of the fight that's coming up now and I'm looking at the names I'm like and 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 the only reason I know that the UFC cuz I look down at the bottom and I see the sign but a lot of the so names we're go over the the main card of this weekend's fight you game say it again so we're going to go over the main card of this coming weekend's fight okay so yeah. first we got well, wait wait Andre, first, we, got, we got to go undercard just a couple fights we got our homeboy Chad Skelly fighting Oh, love Chaz Skelly. Now, what and, do you and, got? And I, I, I'd have to go with Chaz because I know I know Chaz. You know, when I say I know him, I usually go with the guys I know. Okay, right. I usually go with the guys I know. So I got I'll put, I'll take Chaz on that one. Here's what we do here, Bert. We oh, go there's actually some good ones on this other card. Yeah, this is real good. We go with the guys who have been on the show. So if you've been on the show. We got you. We don't care oh, who you fight. You got we, we got right. you. We got you. Your night, your fight, we going to get it right. He's fighting yeah. Jamar Nevers, someone that he said he trained with before, so that should be an interesting one. Okay. We got Eddie Weinman's on the that other side. the underdog, though. Who's, who, who's Eddie Weinman fighting? Eddie Weinman is fighting John Castaneda, a newcomer. Uh -huh. uh, Eddie Weinman. And Eddie is the underdog there too. Does, does, does he have the mustache still? I believe so. This guy's only no, guy looks, fighting only has one fight in the UFC. He's on one, so they're giving Eddie Wineland a newcomer to maybe pick up a win. Well, he, he yeah 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 he uh, he he shouldn't lose that one. We got Dracar Close versus Luis Pena. That's a pretty good matchup. Louis, Louis I got Pena. close all day. Yeah, yeah. I think close takes that one. Okay. Our boy Jared Gordon versus Danny Chavez. We're going to go Jared Gordon all day. Gordon, flash! All yeah. day, all day. I had him. 
I, when I say I had him, I worked with him before he went to the UFC. Okay, yes, uh, CFFC, right? You were there at yes. that point? Yes. Yes, we love Jared here, mentioning the man. Andre Olaski yes. is fighting on this card as well. Who is he fighting? Tom Aspinall. Hey, man, I saw this guy. This guy has, like, crisp boxing. Like, somebody threw, like, a lazy, like, jab. He went, boom, like, one, two. I was like, oh. oh. Yeah, how, many like, fights have, how many fights have Olaski has Olaski won in the last four fights? This guy's two and zero in the UFC with two quick stoppages, two first round stoppages. Olaski, I think, might be coming off a win. Olaski is coming off two wins. He beat Philip Felipe Lima, Felipe Lins, and Tanner Bozer. Okay, okay. I might be going. And, then, Olaski and, and, and this guy, but the guy, this guy's a puncher. This guy's tough, so they're gonna they're both gonna stand on a pocket and probably swing at each other. Arlovsky is the underdog in this fight. Plus uh, two hundred. Okay. Uh, I'll 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 I'm gonna have to go with that one. I mean, I'm going with like so I I go off of, I got there's three ways to pick a fight. Who you want to win, who you think's gonna win, and then where would you put your money? Okay, I'll buy that. Now let me tell you this. There is 15 ways to win a fight. Come on. <laughs> There's yeah. about 15 different ways to win a fight. Okay? And first, the first one is conditioning. Yeah. Okay? You got a guy, you got a guy get past that first round. Anything, anything could happen. Everything is, oh my God. When I see someone gas or like all the, any of the guys I work with like Conditioning is the only thing you have complete control over going into a fight. I'll, I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. Your conditioning. I will totally agree with that. Because, again, the beginning of that is when the lights go on, some people's lights go out. Yeah. Never forget that. So this could be the fight our last gets old. He is fighting a young guy, but... He's one of those people I never want to pick against, Orlowski. Yeah. Well, and he's also he's all one thing about Orlowski that I, I did I've always noticed he's always been in pretty good condition. His conditioning has always been good, and he's never really had a problem with weight. He's forty two going into this one. The guy he's fighting is twenty seven. So Orlowski is forty two. Forty two and still doing it. This will be his fiftieth fight, fiftieth pro fight. <laughs> So I want Arlovsky to win. Okay. I think Tom Aspinall is going to win. Just, I don't, but, I mean, plus 200. Arlovsky just has that at one time. Yeah, yeah. He's got that but kind of power. Aspinall is 2-0? and oh? In the UFC, yeah. He's 9-2 and two overall. His two losses were a couple of years ago, so. Surging, if you will. This is probably be, the fight be. for the number 15 spot in the rankings. I don't know if Arlovsky's in the rankings right now, but Tapology has him at number 16. Okay. Let's, 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 give, it, let's give it to Arlovsky. Let's, let's let him get a stand. We got Nuosadrine Imavov versus Phil Hawes. I got to go with my buddy Phil. I've been with him a little bit out yeah. down in Florida. Yeah. I, I know Phil, 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 so I'd I go, I go with Phil. I'd go with Phil. The guy he's fighting looks tough, but I've always heard amazing things about Phil Hawes. I know he was at Jackson Wink one time. Well, for a time, he was like John Jones' is like secret, John Jones used to say. Like, oh, I have that's, this that's, guy. Yeah, yeah. He fell yeah. short on the contender series, though, correct? Yes. He loves yes. I think Julian Marquez, yes. who just won that fucking that, that fight this past weekend. You saw that, Menace? Yes, yes. Uh, I think he had well, a he was getting his butt kicked and then, like, got the... He got the Anaconda, it, right? Yeah, like, yes. Yeah, like yes. 30 seconds left. Standing. Yeah. So we got Alexi Olenek versus Chris Dawkins. You know Dawkins, right? Dawkins, yes. I know I know him and his brother. Yes, Dawkins is good. I, have to, I, 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 I think I'm going to go with Dawkins. I'm going to go with Dawkins. Was he like be, a Dutch kickboxer? Yes, I'd be totally surprised if I he loses he's that. He's from New Jersey, but he fights like a yeah. Dutch kickboxer. He has very good yeah. hands, Dawkins. From New Jersey. Because yes. uh, all old Nick's thing is if you get you on the ground, right? Old like, Nick's a, bear, a bear on the ground, yeah. He's he's got a, I, I was gonna say he gets you. He gets you. He smothers you. 
and 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 that's where Dawkins Dawkins is not good is not good on 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 his back. Not that anybody is, but but Dawkins really kind of gasped a little when he gets like that. I mean, Olenek has a win over Verdun, so that's like you're pretty good on the ground, bro. If you yeah, good. wow, it's a split decision win, but it came last year. But still, if you're beating. Verdun. I'm gonna go with Olnick. I just think because the Duke could take a shot. I just think he's gonna get it to the ground. I think it ends there. I'm gonna root for right, Dawkins because he's from the Northeast. I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna take Dawkins because because he, he's, he's my man. Derek Minner. If I'm betting, I like Olnick too. Derek Minner, Charles Rosa. We're going Charles right, Rosa. Right, Charles Rosa on Charles the show. Rosa. Yeah, he's the favorite, almost by two, right? He's Charles almost Rosa. Two. Rosa's the favorite. I think he. I think he is. Yeah, I like that. A, a, a negative one ninety. Okay. Okay. And and uh, minor is a plus one fifty. Rosa is a good chef, so we'll have to go with Rosa on that one. <laughs> hey, yeah, but Rosa's last fight, he got slaughtered, right? No. Or has he won? His that? last fight, he won in a war. I forget who he beat, but the fight before okay. that, the Bryce Mitchell fight, where he's yes. Okay. Him. Okay. Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Jeez. Mitchell's a killer on the ground. He showed. It. So yeah, he is. Kevin Vieira versus Yana Kunitskaya will be the co-main event at 135. I've only seen uh, Kunitskaya. I've never seen this other chick fight, I don't think. Um, the Brazilian. Um, which, which Brazilian is it? This is Ketlin Vieira. Ketlin Vieira's got yeah. Ashley Evan Smith. She beats Sarah McMahon. You know what? I, I, I kind of like her. I kind of yes. like her. She has that one yeah. fight that she got caught by Irene Aldana, caught her with a left yeah, yes. in exchange. Yes, yes. But that was one of those fights where she was probably going to win. She was now, th- now, remember what I said, Dennis. I said there's 15 ways to win a fight. We 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 just gone about through 10 of them just now, and every one of them has been different. Right. Uh, I'm going for Kutnitskaya. Am I saying that right? Kutnitskaya. I'll say Yana. But if I'm a betting man, and I think Vieira's gonna win. Mm. She's, she's, I, I, I think she's pretty scrappy, man. I think she's, I think she's, I think she's pretty scrappy, and she needs to win this one. So main event: I mean, Curtis Blades versus Derek Lewis. Two top five. Yes. I'm, I'm going with Derek Lewis. I'm, I love Derek Lewis. I'm going to uh, root for Derek Lewis. I think this yeah, fight's going yeah. to be an ugly ass whooping on the ground. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You said ugly on the ground. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll go with that. I think I think that 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 Derek Lewis needs this fight. And and I think I think they got him as an underdog in this one. If you take out Francis and Gano, yeah, he's a plus three hundred. Derek Lewis, Oof. Derek Lewis is a plus three hundred. Curse plays at a minus four hundred. Like what was the last fight with um Curtis Blades? We saw him dominate Volkov, and then he gassed at the very yes, end, sir. and Volkov started fucking him up in like the fifth round. And, I don't know if Derek was Lewis. Talk, has, was talking about it. Yeah, I don't know if Derek Lewis has that as good of grappling as Volkov to even keep. Curtis Blades from mauling him while he's healthy or yeah. has energy. I, I like Derek Lewis, but Curtis Blades has been on the show. He's a wrestler. He's the favorite. And I, I think, go there. Yeah, I love Kurt. I love Derek Lewis. Great Instagram, one of the best in MMA. But Curtis, he hasn't Blades. come on the Best of the Man show though. So nope. <laughs> let me tell you something. It, it's it's and something you guys have just said, and, and it's something I've always. We just went through that 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 card, and there wasn't out out of, out of the ten or eleven, there was maybe one gimme in there. One thing I say about MMA from the beginning, I never never ever saw an easy fight. Yeah. I never saw at you know like in boxing at the, at a the time there was a time when they needed to get a guy twenty five wins before you got a USA date. On television, because a guy you couldn't just have a guy with a nine and five and get a USA fight, but if you had a guy twenty and one and another guy thirty one, you got you got the date. So 
the fights were, I don't, they were easier. I never, ever thought that the UFC gave guys easy fights. Never. I now, always, are you saying there's no easy fights because everybody's really good? Or are you saying that, like, some people aren't so good that, like Amanda I, Nunes, like, who's going to beat her? Well, I, I, when I say easy fights, I'm talking about the matchmaking and the putting the guys together. Uh, the matchups are, are always pretty competitive. You know, it's it's because you can you can. I mean, even though like or like this guy is three and zero, and Olaski's had fifty two fights. It's not a given because Olaski's had fifty two fights, and this guy's only had. 10 total or whatever, it's not a, it's not a given. You know, I just think that the matchmaking in MMA has always been pretty good. I think they've always given people good matches, never given anybody a gimme where you can definitely say, oh, man, there's no way this guy's going to win this fight. It's weird. Why did why, why he even put this fight together? With the four ounces versus the eight or ten ounces. Like, you've seen guys, one punch can change a fight in boxing. But MMA... Yeah. One little touch with those four ounce gloves, even a jab sometimes goes. Holy shit, I'm fucked right now. Like I'm in bad shape. Like that. Yeah. That in boxing, you rarely see those upsets where twenty and zero gets beat by the five and five or the ten and five, yeah. ten and ten. Yeah. MMA very, very rarely a five a guy who has twenty and ten could easily beat the guy who's twenty and two. You know, like just takes one. An example yeah. I'll, I'll use is Matt Serra. With GSP, okay, just, take, just okay. takes one, just takes one sometimes. Yeah, but he has been fighting for a long time. Yeah, but, oh, that, but I'm that, saying guys could have both have experience. If you got thirty fights and he's got thirty fights and he's twenty five and five and you're sixteen and fourteen, that's a live fight. In MMA with the little gloves, it's weird. It's different. Boxing, the twenty five and five guys should win, is gonna win. Like it's. It, huge odds in his favor. Then there's also padding your record. Because I remember fighting a guy that one time that was 10 and 0, and I was like, this is one of my easier fights versus a guy that was like yeah. 7 and 4. But MMA has way more intangibles. Like even Bert said, way more ways to win a fight. Way more ways for the fight. 15. <laughs> I, I, I count 15, and I don't even know the name of all of them. Yeah. You know? Somebody said, oh, he just anaconda him with a butterfly choke neck. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you just said three things in one move. But but either one of them, he could have won that fight with. And I've always been amazed with that because there are so many ways to win a fight. It's, it's really hard for me to sit and say how somebody could absolutely say 100%. Unless this guy was making his pro debut fighting... To be, you know, then you could probably probably sit back and think, why would they put this match together? But in MMA, there's so many ways to win a fight. Real quick, yes, winning fights, judging. Do you think it's perfect, like, or should the judging in MMA be changed? <laughs> uh, I because we always... have the answer. It's more judges, like a higher. Well, well, I, I, here's what I honestly think. Number one, that, that's never, ever, ever, ever going to change. That's why I tell you never, ever, ever leave it to the judges. Knock him out. Get him out there. Submit him. Don't leave it to the judges. They were fighting about judging since 1970. Since 1970, they were complaining about judging and how people judge fights. You know, in all eras, it's the same. And, and I don't think that that's ever going to change because it's, it's, it's human. It's, they even went to a point in, in, in one Olympics where they were using stand. I think they had the, the automated judging or something in, in one of the Olympics. Didn't they have that? Yes. With, you know, they were trying to test that out. Let's see if this works. You got human beings sitting there judging the fight. I don't think that's ever, 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 ever going to change. You're no, what I'm saying 
there are three judges right now. They have a bigger MMA opinion. MMA could maybe be the forefront in changing the scoring system, but realistically, boxing's been around and in the main spotlight for over 100 years, and scoring is still the same as it always was, and it always kind of sucked. It always can be skewed. It always – Connor versus Floyd, perfect example. Connor didn't win a round in the first five rounds. Floyd openly admitted, I was giving you away rounds. I didn't throw punches. Yeah. And the judges were like, nope, 10-9, Floyd Mayweather. Boxing Floyd is Mayweather. still fucked up. Fighting MMA could, because they're smaller and they're on their up right now, change it now, but they most likely won't. Like seven judges. Yeah, more judges, because then what that would be is you'd see the you'd see the balance a little more, maybe five to two, but you'd still maybe get four to three, which is a split decision. And, you know? and, a, and, and a bigger cluster. Okay, I don't want to use that last word, but you know that last – that word that comes behind cluster that doesn't rhyme with it. Right. Uh, I, I, I just I just I just think that that's that's a part of the sport, of any sport, judging and refereeing. It's it, it, it it's it's human error. It's you got human beings doing it and you got human opinion. That's so why more story, judges the open the scoring is of the the But Dana said it really well why the open scoring would suck is that suspense that we've had in fighting for my whole life in 100 years where a fight's really close. They go to the scorecards. They read out 114, 115 for this guy, 116, 112 for this guy, 116, 112, and the winner by split decision. Like if we did open scoring, we would lose that moment where they fucking yeah. have those like both guys. But you can still have seven judges. Yeah. So well, I and, think, and, 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 and and you know how many you know how many how many decisions joint judges have you know the unanimous decision you know the open decision I mean it's it's just it's just too many it's just too much of a cluster I think the three that they got now is pretty good I think maybe if they train them and give them a little few more fights and have more consistency in the in the judging, I think, would probably help it a little bit. One thing for, we'll what say the, for, what would it take for me and Stan to become a judge? For no, you here's for, the thing, though. If you have former fighters become judges, would they know better? Yes, but the bias would also come in. Oh, he because yeah. it's such a small fraternity. Oh, so he knows that guy. I trained with that guy back when I was in that state, and blah 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 blah. I'm gonna lean, I'm already leaning towards this guy before the fight starts. So you're probably only gonna watch and judge what he lands, unless the other guy's I, I, I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly how many fights, but but judges are not trained in terms of classes and times. You know, a guy a guy gets familiar with the commission, and I, I don't know what it is today. I, I can't speak for 2020 or 2021. But I know that beforehand, you know, if a guy went to a commission and said, I wanted to be a judge, they would have him go to a couple amateur fights and then go to a couple pro fights and then they give his guy his license and they would let him work a couple of rounds and he's a, he's a judge or a referee, you know. And it's, it's not something that you have to work on for five years or six years or seven years or anything like that. But then the majority of the judges and referees I know have been around a long time. There have got there are guys that are still refing it. Well, not the refs. A lot, most of the refs are gone. But I, I look at fights in Las Vegas, and the judges that are there. Out of ten of them, I know all ten of them, but they've been around a long time and still boxing, don't get it. They've been right. boxing judges, then MMA judges, yes. and yes. And yes. the crazy thing is, too, they're all probably someone's cousin. Or someone's neighbor, or something, and that's how they got the job for the commission. They're not qualified. They need to raise the qualifications. I I, I would I would agree with, I would agree that the, that they need to put a a legitimate program together that 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 has some consistency to it, and the same consistency that you have with the state athletic commissions. That's how they need to organize. Their judges and 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 their referees. They need Burt Watson. They have job is what it is. They need Burt Watson <laughs> set this thing up. I'll tell you one thing. That's one thing that I wouldn't want to do is 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 judging. You know, uh, I, I think I'd be a little too critical. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You'd have a little bit of. That's what you need. 
you'd have that bias a little bit. Okay. I'll, I, I'll, I'll, buy, I'll, buy, I'll buy that. I'll buy that with the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. With, the, with the knowledge of it. But so here, Bert, where can people find you, the new podcast? Hey, man. I love social media. So any place, anyone, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, it's Bert Watson. Bert Watson, Bert Watson for real. Plug in. You reach out, I'll reach back out to you. And I my, my show now is Legends to Legends on MMA Junkie. Bert Watson for real, baby. Your night, your fight. Please get it right, baby. Oh, for real, Bert. You're the man. We want to thank you for the time. And again, we'd love to have even small little clips. Give us a little bit of Bert. It was a five minute hey, story every I, other week or so. I, I I I'd love that. I've been around that man so long. I know I I know what his hair looked like without that hat on. <laughs> That's what we like here, Bert. We're trying to get you know. You see what we're doing here? We're just a buddy show. We just like to shoot the shit with people, get some cool stories. If you weren't I, married, I, I if you weren't it. married, we'd be talking about all the girls you're pulling. You know, that's what we're into here. <laughs> uh, and I'm still rolling, baby. But I appreciate it, man. I appreciate the invitation. Appreciate the invite. Then, Bert, I'll text with you. I'll get on yes, Legends sir. Legends. My pleasure. Please, everybody, make sure you follow your boy. Your night, your fight, get it right. Good um, man, Bert. Bert. Thank you for the time, brother. Thank appreciate you it, time. baby. We rolling. All right, Menace, let's wrap this up. Yeah, I got to go eat. Uh, my lady made uh, some broccoli, cream of broccoli. The legendary Burt Watson joined us. Ah, uh, stunning. This was a good one. He's probably got so much more shit. Oh, endless, endless. Yeah. Bro, for like decades, he said, every, oh, every show. That's a shot that I need you to shoot is hit him with, yes. We're being sincere. We really want you to come on in like two weeks or something and just give us a five minute story. And we'll have it be oh like my God. story time with Burt Watson. Tyron Woodley just hit me, just finished training. So say next week, or unless you want to do it right now. I got to go. All right, so tell him 100% next week. Let's set it up. Tell him next week, 7 o'clock. What would have to be 8? 8, whatever you got. Whatever you want to do, player. And I'll make All right, sure that that I'll do it from Sanford and that will we have right. a better connection and whatnot. But it was good. So you have Gilbert over, his, over your shoulder? No one's over my shoulder now. I switched it. No, there. I'm saying if you were doing it from Sanford, we had Tyron on. That's on, man. Oh, who would you over my shoulder? Gilbert. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, remember have you all worked? Bro, I mean, I like Tyrone, but Gilbert beat him pretty bad that first. But whatever. Well. See you later. It was good seeing you, man. Likewise, Buzz. Stay, stay safe. Mm -hmm.